Tiger Woods is back this week at the Hero World Challenge, but unfortunately, only in a hosting capacity. In this edition of the Golf Social Podcast, by the way, I'm Lav, soon to be joined by Rex. We do have Rex Hoggard in the Bahamas, giving us the lowdown on Tiger's foot injury, his outlook for 2023, and his thoughts on the acrimonious state of elite men's golf. But first... Callaway has developed the longest irons ever in the Rogue ST line. These irons are breaking ground with a high-strength 450 AI face cup that's never been seen before in the industry. Callaway has continued to push innovation through their patented urethane microspheres and have massively increased their precision tungsten weighting. The Rogue ST lineup is available in four options to suit every type of player, including the Rogue ST Max for incredible speed, forgiveness, and performance. They're available now. And for more information, visit CallawayGolf.com. Rex, you are in Albany. Uh, your cancer spot above your right eye uh, does not look too uh, sunburned at the moment. You're inside uh, in a very dank media center, which is not befitting uh, of your environs. What, what's the deal? What's the deal this I, Tuesday of Hero World Challenge Week? I was going to go back to the hotel so we could uh, record this, but that was going to take probably another hour or two, and I didn't want to leave you waiting or our fans waiting for the podcast, so I decided to find a, a quiet corner, but it looks like a proof of life video. If you, and we'll, we'll put some of these up on the website here, but it does not look like I'm, I'm sitting in paradise. I kind of am sitting in para paradise. I'm glad you brought up the thing over my right eye because we, we've discussed this numerous times. I get a lot of pushback on, on social media about this, and I will say, that most of it's very nice. Hey, you probably need to get that looked at. I have a very good dermatologist in Orlando, Florida, and she is awesome. And I apparently guess not. I go apparently, see her once a year. And it's, she's it's got great. a license. Uh, I will say though, last week I was in New Orleans for uh, the Delahousie uh, slash Hoggard Thanksgiving. Yes, three hundred people, people were talking about this. 300, 300 people. It's just absolutely insane. Yes, it was just a free-for-all, but there was a lot of turkey and a lot of good food. However, the people we were staying with are cousins. They live kind of next door to where the, the big party was, and they are both dermatologists. And I will tell you, there was a very awkward moment one night when I was just kind of sitting on the couch watching TV when the husband walked out and he had some sort of flashlight magnifying glass in his hand. And he goes, would you really mind if I took a closer look at that? It's going to bug me if I don't get a, get a good look at it. And I was like, sure, have at it. He was fine with it. As well, he definitely says it should be biopsied, so that's coming up. We got oh good, we can oh good, we can hack that out of your face. Yeah, so I'm gonna have a big crater right there above my right eye, as if it's not uh, blinding enough already as it is. Oh, that's Jeez. wonderful. Make sure make sure you schedule that uh, procedure for just before <laughs> Masters Week uh, in 2023. Uh, Skincare is no joke, kids. Skincare is no joke. It is. It is. You're right, Rex. Especially as someone who suffers from rosacea, uh, I am all aboard the dermatology train. Uh, unfortunately for you, Rex, uh, you flew into the Bahamas on Monday, roughly uh, 39 seconds after you landed. Uh, Tiger Woods announced <laughs> exactly. uh, that, he, that he withdrew from this week's 20-man exhibition because of plantar fasciitis. 50-year-old men uh, in the country unite. Uh, over this diagnosis, he said that uh, this happened as he ramped up his preparation and uh, kind of his practice regimen ahead of the Hero World Challenge. This was supposed to be the beginning of kind of a busy stretch for Tiger. Has hashtag Tiger season. Uh, he's going to play the Hero. Uh, still scheduled to play next week's match alongside Roy McIlroy, Justin Thomas, and Jordan Speed, the top four in the PIP. And then the following week, uh, the week before Christmas, uh, he and son Charlie would once again team up at the PNC Championship. As of now, Tiger Woods is still scheduled to play in the latter two events. Uh, he'll be able to use a cart uh, in those two events, which is why he is still full systems go. But no no go, Rex, for the Hero World Challenge because this planner fasciitis. You saw Tiger up close and personal today. Uh, how did he look? How did he sound? Uh, he sounded fine, and, and he looked okay. I will tell you, it was interesting. I went on golf today right after... Tiger Woods spoke, and they were showing videos of him earlier this summer at the Open Championship, and certainly at Augusta, back in the spring in the PGA Championship. And they were kind of pointing out the limp that has been there, really, since the, the audio accident in 2021. Completely understandable. Multiple surgeries on his right leg. It was, it, it, as he's pointed out on numerous occasions, he's lucky to still have a leg. But I will say, watching him get up and come into the media center and then walk out of the media center, he's clearly 
moving your, around gingerly. And I don't want to make light of this. Like I know that we lean into the hijinks and we like to have jokes and jokes and jokes. I, I don't plantar, want to make plantar fasciitis is no laughing matter, Rex. It is not. I've never had it. I have plenty of people who have told me, have reached out to me and said it's excruciatingly painful. I don't think anyone is going to question whether or not if Tiger Woods is, is strong or if he's tough enough to tough it out. I mean, this is a guy that won a U.S. Open on a broken leg, so we can all agree. We can all agree on just one thing, and that's Tiger And he Woods won a tough. Masters title with a fused back. Yes, he, he's plenty tough enough to, to pull through this. But I will say it just doesn't fit the scenario. When we talk about this, there's the one-legged he was open victory and you're right to fuse back master's victory and just horrific car crash and multiple surgeries and just the litany of medical issues that he's had to deal with in his life. And then out of left field, we get plantar fasciitis, which means, which in my mind, I immediately went to, so you're telling me you didn't have the right orthotics in, and that's why you can't play the hero. Exactly. World Challenge. Again, I'm not trying to make light of this. And I know it's, this is no joking matter. Anyone who's had it. However, this one kind of hit me differently because we're used to, very very severe things when it comes to tiger woods we're used to talking we're used to consulting with doctors and trying to get an idea of exactly what he's been through on this one you're right you can, you can probably go to your dad and be like dad what's that feel like and he'll tell you it hurts uh my dad who is a runner a marathon runner he's run like five thousand straight days at least four miles just absolutely insane he has had plantar fasciitis uh, of course he still toughed it out uh, and ran but yes he said it is excruciatingly painful tiger did say it's going to knock him out rex uh for the next month or two not that it necessarily matters uh, because he didn't have any tournaments on his upcoming schedule i'd be shocked if we saw him uh before obviously the genesis invitational when he looks ahead to 2023 as he stated all along even at the beginning of this year his schedule going forward i'm not sure why we have to keep repeating this but apparently we do because of the people on twitter he is just going to try to play the the major championships, and then maybe one or two regular events on the PGA Tour schedule. If you're putting, if you're kind of connecting the dots, ambitious. yes, Riviera would be one of those, and you would think the Players' Championship would be the other one. As we saw this past year, 2022, Tiger Woods played three of the major championships, was not healthy enough uh, to compete in the U.S. Open, and he actually uh, let slip today, Rex Tiger did, uh, that he had two unplanned procedures uh, this year. He's very vague on those surgeries. Uh, the only thing he said about the timing uh, was that it was this, this year. year. Uh, obviously, the time off between the PJ Championship and the Open Championship, the about three months span there, uh, excuse me, two months span there, uh, seems a, a likely time that one of those would have happened, especially since he suffered uh, a setback uh, with his surgically repaired foot at southern hill so what do you what do you make of this rex obviously plantar fasciitis as we've just outlined is no laughing matter but it does kind of speak does it not to the brittle nature of this tiger woods comeback he said uh, repeatedly in almost uh, in a tone of resignation that he doesn't have much left in this right leg uh, does this make you more uh, it certainly doesn't make you more optimistic but how pessimistic does it make you uh, regarding his outlook for next year and potentially beyond? I don't think it changed my outlook at all, to be honest with you. I mean, the fact that he actually mentioned the four majors and then two others actually get, made me pause for a little bit. Like, huh, that's that's more than I would have expected because it seems like, especially after what we saw this year, you pointed out he played in three of the four majors. He didn't finish one of those majors. He had to withdraw from the PGA Championship. Now, very hilly golf course, very demanding conditions. I get it. And then, of course, he missed the cut at the Open Championship. I, I feel like for him to say that, oh, yeah, maybe I could add two more onto that. It gives you a reason to be optimistic. Well, I, I mean, he's kind of got two constituents there, does he not? I mean, the yes. Genesis Invitational benefits his foundation just like the Hero World Challenge does, and the Players' Championship is the PGA Tour's flagship event. I can, I can, see, him, I can see him floating that out there, but he's <laughs> like, eh, I think I'm also set for Augusta National the second week of April. And that's what he's going to focus on. We all know that. He talked about that this year. Like, it was interesting hearing him talk just now about his uh, – initially, his only goal was the Open Championship at St. Andrews. Like, everything else was on the back burner. Like, everything he was trying to get through 2021 going into 2022 was to get ready for St. Andrews because he knew he had the institutional knowledge to play that golf course as well, if not better, than anyone else. And he also knew that as long as it wasn't a crazy weather week, it's a relatively flat walk, it was going to be the easiest of the four majors on his body – and it turns out it's when he played the worst. And I think there is a lesson to be learned that you can't sit here and pick a card and decide that, okay, out of the 52 weeks, 
this is the one I want to play my best, that that's going to be dictated now by things that are out of his control, which in this case is a right leg that, as you mentioned, multiple surgeries, he won't say how many, as you mentioned, the fact that the plantar fasciitis was a direct result of that injury and all of those, uh, those surgeries that came afterwards, it's not getting any better. So no, I don't, I didn't walk away from that con press conference being optimistic because I simply think that he knows better than any of us that he's closer to the end than the beginning by far now. Yeah. I'm probably going to butcher uh, his exact phrasing of this, but he essentially said like, how do you, how do you make progress without like going over the cliff, like pushing yourself too far and then having a setback like he did here uh, at the hero world challenge. That's the, that's the struggle that he's going to face. Like he turns 47 years old uh, next month. He's had a litany of injuries, surgeries, and ailments. Like it probably rivals the number of major championships that he's won in 15, the number of uh, surgical procedures that he's had to undergo. And the game and the players, uh, certainly at the top level, are just so much bigger, faster, and stronger than in Woods' prime that I, it, it almost just seems wishful thinking that he can just turn up a couple of times a year and expect to get into contention. He said today, kind of catch lightning in a bottle, which is quite frankly what I think he would have to do. Like, I think it surprised everyone, probably a uh, tiger included that, that, that he did make the cut in two major championships. That's obviously a testament to his remarkable uh, skill uh, and the talent that he still possesses, but also a lot of grit and guile uh, and course management. Uh, skills that he has honed now over the past quarter century but making the cut in a major is a long way off from actually playing your way into contention in the game's biggest events and I still wonder Rex like if if T37 or T48 is the best that he can do in a major championship like how much longer will he put himself through that you and Murray uh, other guardian posed that question to Tiger, like, why are you still doing this? Like, why don't you just uh, kind of call it quits at this stage? You have nothing left to prove. He says, I still love to compete. Well, that love is going to fade if he's no longer tasting competition. I understand the work um, and, you know, the preparation that goes into it and, and kind of the feeling of being inside the ropes uh, in events that define your legacy. But at some point, you just kind of have to throw your hands up and say, I don't think I have it anymore. And I think he's, I think he's getting dangerously close to that point. Well, and I'll take it a step farther. I, I, I think it's interesting when he talks about these added procedures in the last summer, however many he's had, you mentioned two, I, there could be five, there could be two, however many he's not letting us in on that secret, but he w does say there's more procedures. At what point does he pull the plug on that as well? Like at some point it just builds up. What, what am I, what am I getting ready for here? And he kind of flippantly refers to, if I still have my leg eight years from now. Yes, I, mean, I was I was just going to mention that when he when a reporter brought up potentially playing in the next Open Championship, he's like, "If my leg is still there, yeah." And like, and he, I, I, that's very crude, but like, hmm, is he at least thinking amputation? Apparently, I mean, at this tournament a year ago, you were there. He said 50-50 that his right leg was going to need to be amputated. Yeah, I mean, he was just surprised as anyone getting out of that hospital in Los Angeles with his leg intact because they told him that there's a good chance that you walk out of here on one leg or however that 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 works out i would argue that at some point that builds up more than anything else the pain and the energy that it takes to get anywhere close to being competitive in his mind whatever it took for him to get ready for augusta and we can all agree that look he exceeded certainly our expectations and maybe his own expectations on some level but whatever the pain and the structure and the you know the, the protocols were to get him just to that point I can only imagine how painful and how much he put himself through to get to that point. And it's, it, he has to reach a, a point of diminishing returns in all of this. He has to reach somewhere where he's just going to decide that this isn't worth it anymore. It, it really has to be a frustrating scenario for Tiger. Like today's press conference, I thought was as lucid as we've heard him uh, in a long time. We're certainly going to get into his other talking points that he's had uh, during this uh, press conference, which was, 30, 40 minutes at length, touching on a variety of topics. And he said, look, he's still shooting four, five, six, seven under par uh, at medalist uh, in practice rounds, but he's also zipping around in a cart. The actual hitting a golf ball is not the problem. It's the walking of uh, 72 holes in tournament competition, the standing on your feet for six, seven hours a day that's required with the warm up, standing in between shots, and then the post round debrief. It's just, it's just it's, it's not going to get easier 
Um, yeah. And so it does certainly make it feel uh, like the window is closing. So that's Tiger's kind of outlook injury wise. And the reason why he's not teeing it up this week in the Bahamas alongside 20 uh, of the best players in the world. But I thought perhaps just as interesting Rex uh, were Tiger's thoughts on live golf and the current state and on golfchannel.com on Monday in lieu of my usual Monday scramble, I wrote a column uh, how the time is now for Tiger to embrace this role as a leader, kind of be the outspoken voice uh, for the PGA Tour. He clearly has a legion of admirers. And so I thought this was certainly going to be an opportunity for him to take his claims to the PGA Tour, explain uh, why the future on the PGA Tour is so bright. And I thought uh, he did that emphatically uh, in this press conference, certainly uh, knocking back Greg Norman, leader of Live Golf, uh, six or seven times uh, by my estimation, saying that he needs to go. But what did you make, not just of his barbs against Greg Norman, but his talks about uh, possible reconciliation uh, between the two rival tours, Rex. I, I think I brought this up two weeks ago when Rory was kind of the first one to broach this subject. That he actually cracked the door open. And, and we can all agree that Rory is the de facto spokesperson when it comes to the PGA Tour and all things lift off. He's the leader in this. And I do find it fascinating that Tiger is more than willing to follow on this, that he loves the lead that Rory is sitting, setting, and he's fine being the guy in the sidecar pointing directions, giving out information, and yet he's still sort of just the sidekick at this point, which is interesting to me on, on another level. The part that got me today is for someone who, for the better part of two plus decades, has made an art out of being able to talk for a long time without saying much at all, if anything, he actually leaned into it today. I mean, he used words like uh, anxiety and angst and disrespect and all of the things that he pointed Animosity. out. Animosity. Yeah. animosity all of these things that he pointed out that he felt like not just towards greg norman you're right i mean he set the same caveat that rory said when it comes to any potential talks but also to speak so forcefully and to get on that side of it look from the very beginning of this those hardliners with the pga tour have said all along that there's no way we can coexist this isn't going to happen i think it's very significant that within a two three two and a half week window both rory and tiger you know the, the two alpha males out in front for the pga tour have both opened the door, however slight, and it is very, very slight because there's a lot of other things that need to happen. Norman has to go, and the lawsuit has to go away, and then we can actually just sit down and have a conversation. That's a big hill for everyone to climb, but I, I do think that at least now there's a sliver of light. At least now we can see that, okay, that's how we sit down and we come to some sort of coexistence because you and I have had this conversation. I don't know where we go if right now is the status quo. If this is where we're going to be 10 years from now, it's going to be a tough existence for everybody involved. There seems to be, Rex, this, this universal sentiment that there needs to be some sort of resolution, that these two tours do need to coexist, that these two bodies do need to get together and hammer out some sort of deal. And I sit here on November 29th at the end of uh, perhaps uh, – the most uh, bitter and contentious year in golf history. And I'm wondering why, why, why do these two tours need to coexist? Why can't they just go down their separate lanes? If you're the PGA tour, why do you want to give in to live golf? If you look at live golf right now on November 29th, they have secured I think more top name players than we were expecting. Certainly Dustin Johnson is a big blow. Cameron Smith, the reigning open champion and players winner uh, was a big blow. Phil Mickelson was number two in the pip in 2021, a hugely popular figure. That is a big blow. I'm not discounting any of those Bryson Brooks, whatever the case may be. But when you look at their league format for 2023, you're not going to have this slow trickle and all of these rumors that clouded so much of 2022. As of right now, November 29th, Liv does not yet have a TV deal. It doesn't have any corporate sponsorships. I'm not sure if you're the PGA Tour, what the impetus or the incentive is to sit down at the table with Liv, other than they want to have all of the best players in one spot and not just 95% of them, just throwing out random numbers. 
uh, housekeeping, one, you're right, they don't have a TV deal, no corporate sponsors. World Ranking Points is probably bigger than those two, to be quite honest with you. They don't have World Ranking Points. That's, that's the primary issue for them as we go down the line. The other side of it, to answer your question, it's unsustainable for the PGA Tour. Tiger Woods just talked about it, and they're saying that, okay, they spent $2 billion this year. What's going to stop them from spending 4 or $5 billion next year? Nothing is the answer. This is what they really want, and we're talking it's about- It's probably going to win out. You're, you're, you're right. Like That's probably going yes. to win out. It's a battle that the tour is going to lose, which is which is unbelievable that we would say that because we know how flush the tour is with cash. They just signed new TV deals uh, across the line. They have long term deals with corporate sponsors, FedEx, uh, Travelers, whoever these sponsors are who have signed on for five or 10 years down the road. And yet this is a bidding war. They're not going to win. They know that, which is why they've sort of circled the wagons and tried to make this about those 20. They've, they've magically created this 20 that we're going to protect at all costs. And above, over and above everything else, that's why there has to be a detente. Both sides realize that this is this is an untenable situation, not sustainable. For Live Golf, it's more ranking points, and to a lesser degree, the things you pointed out with TV deals. For the PGA Tour, it's not a battle they can win. If this keeps going down the road, that look, Tiger and Rory have said all the right things, and they've stood up, and Tiger just did it. Like, this is about legacy. I asked Tiger point blank, like, why did you feel compelled to not just fly to that meeting in Delaware, but to leave the charge and what did you say? And he gave a really good answer about how I needed to, to paint the picture to the younger generation, to this generation of why it's important for you to stay put where you are. Because it's not about winning, you know, disrespect to any regular tour event, but that's not what this is about. This is about winning major championships and getting in the Hall of Fame. His words, not mine. That's only going to hold up so long because there's going to be a generation that comes after this that's going to all of a sudden start looking and liking the guaranteed money. And you don't have to be Nostradamus to figure this out. I still don't know what the resolution looks like. And there's still a lot of ifs and buts. Oh, to I don't think potentially get to this scenario, right, Rex? Like, so clearly Norman has to go for folks on the PGA Tour side to even feel comfortable talking about a potential settlement, settlement or a stay, to use Tiger's word, uh, in the litigation. Obviously, Live right Golf. Word, yeah, yeah Live, Live Golf has. Sued the PGA Tour, the antitrust uh, uh, litigation. The tour has countersued. Uh, and so both of those uh, would need to be paused uh, before any sort of uh, resolution can be reached. Tiger didn't have any answers on what uh, the current golf or the golf landscape looks like in 2023 and beyond. No, at least not publicly. I, I mean, my guess is for Rory and Tiger to both go down this road. They're, they're singing off the same sheet. That makes sense because, look, they, they're in together. But then to go both go down the same road and crack that door, however slightly, saying that if Norman goes, that we can't have a conversation. It seems to me that they have ruminated and come up with an idea that, okay, maybe this will work. I just got a copy of the, sort of the tentative live golf schedule for next year. And I, I kind of went through it just vaguely because I'm going to go ahead and write it only because I'm kind of fascinated to see how this version of 14 events is going to fit into the PGA Tour schedule. And again, if there was a conversation to be had, maybe at some point the PGA Tour and Live Golf can come to some sort of understanding that, okay, you get these four months and we'll take these six months and then leave December. I'm, I'm sorry, you know, the last two months of the year, November yeah. and December. I mean, if, if it's, if it's going to happen, the fall has to be seated to live. And I think the PGA Tour yeah. would say, have at it. If you want Have at it. a time a time of year when no one's watching and the stars are burned out and these tournaments don't mean anything, please have September through yes. December. You can absolutely and, and, have it. And, and maybe they're they're scattered in. I mean, maybe you find ways in the summertime to scatter these in. Because, look, the tour has already created their own version of this with the elevated events. So now you start working around the elevated events and the majors and the one WGC that remains. And now all of a sudden there are open dates in the summer. And maybe you slot two or three of those in the summer and then you give – Live Golf, the fall. That's a possibility. I'm not saying the tour is going to want to do that. I'm not saying Live Golf has any interest in that, but certainly that's where the dialogue needs to start. So I don't think that Tiger or Rory just throw this out willy nilly with no idea where we're going to go. Because I don't think for a minute that everyone's been sitting in these meetings now for months and they haven't come up with some sort of solution. I yeah, I that. mean, that's, yeah, that's the, that's kind of the solution that I've heard. Most often, it's just kind of seed most of the live schedule to the fall. If the PGA Tour stars, if they're not already exhausted from playing in these 14 elevated events, I guess they only have to play 13 technically, uh, plus the major championships, plus the team event if you're from the United States 
or from Europe. If you still want to go chase that guaranteed money at a time of year when it doesn't matter uh, and you potentially uh, set yourself up for having no off season, go nuts. Have at it. You can uh, add, you can, you can add another 10 to $15 million uh, to your bank account uh, and feel happy about it. It's just unclear uh, kind of how that would work, which players would sign up for it. If Liv would go for that, does it get world ranking points? Does it, how does it fit with like their whole team concept? If it's, if it's more scattered throughout the PJ tour schedule, uh, I think all of that obviously uh, is to be hashed out. Now, one other thing Rex uh, that I wanted to get your take on was tiger's uh, thoughts on the official world golf rank. I believe you typed this up for us on GolfChannel.com. Uh, tiger Woods echoing thoughts uh, from John Rom just a couple of weeks ago in Dubai with the DP world tour season finale, uh, got markedly fewer points than the full field event at the RSM Classic uh, on the PJ Tour, despite the PJ Tour event having zero top 25 players in the world and Dubai having six of the top 20. Tiger called it a flawed system and something that we all recognize. Uh, somehow, we need to come up with a better system than is in place right now. Cam Smith, uh, who's playing uh, over in Australia, uh, called the uh, OWGR irrelevant, uh, kind of parroting some talking points from the live folks as they are trying to gain uh, access to that system. What was your take on Tiger's take on the world rankings? He didn't use laughable. That, that would have been the only laughable. way to make it better. Laughable, that, that, that laughable. Yeah, that was John Rahm's thing. Uh, but you're right. It, it's, it, doesn't, it doesn't work. It doesn't hold up. And look, in, specifically in Tiger's case, it is interesting. If you go back, John Rahm's comments were kind of on the other side of where Rory was on this issue. Rory was a little bit more, I want to say, even-headed because he, he has probably been a little bit more involved in how the new ranking system was created. So he has a better idea of exactly why. Well, there's 156 players at Sea Island. It's the example everyone wanted to use, which means you have to beat 155 other guys as opposed to, I believe there was 50 players at the DP World Tour Championship. So you've got to beat 49. Just by simple math, you're doing better if you win at Sea Island than you do at DP World. Now, we can all agree, and I think Tiger probably is, is this is what he's leaning into, that if you have seven top 25 players, including the world number one, it doesn't matter how big your field is. You sort of have to be able to acknowledge that. And that, I thought was Tiger's point. He didn't use the word laughable because I think he wants to come at this with the idea that let's just sit down and fix it. That's where we are right now. And I think everyone can agree, probably even Rory, saying that it's not a perfect system. We probably need to tinker with it and fix it a little bit. But we can all agree also on the idea that the they one thing They did just fix it. They did just fix it. It took three years. It took an independent body. And this is what they came up with. It is, it is kind of ironic, is it not, Rex, that most of the time this limited field, is, and it's pretty clear that this new system hates limited fields, it's, it's more going to affect the PGA Tour than the DP World Tour. Like the PGA Tour is the one that's going to have – uh, potentially all of these limited field events in 2024. Lots of talk of it going to the kind of the BMW championship format of 70 guys. Like that's going to be affected. We saw how it affected the tour championship. It's going to be affected with tournaments like the century tournament of champions uh, at Kapalua while the DP world tour is the one that's going to have full field full 132, one four forty four, one fifty six. 156. Uh, that's interesting to point out. And also tiger who has benefited as much as anyone from absolutely mopping up in the World Golf Championship events or other <laughs> limited field events. I think he would beat a, a field, whether it was 20, 50, 75, or 7,500 uh, back in his heyday. Uh, but it was interesting to have him such a strong stance uh, coming out against, uh, against the system that he's kind of benefited from. Well, and also keep in mind that this new system impacts this particular week negatively, right? So there's not as many world ranking points here because it is only a 20-man field. Certainly it hits home. For Tiger Woods, and I'll go back to the conversation. But it's still, but it's still like double. It's still like double the Australian Open. Yeah, because I think it recognizes the fact that the twenty players that are here are ranked much, much higher than what they have at the Australian Open. I'll go back to my comments two weeks ago on this, and I don't disagree with what John said. And actually, when when you have an athlete throwing out laughable, laughable, laughable like that, that's good stuff. Like you and I dug in, and I absolutely love the passion on this one. Uh, Yep, num num num, just the grief eater. However. I will say that DP World Tour had a vote on this. Like Keith Kelly was sitting right next to John Rahm, shaking his, nodding his head as he's saying these comments. Well, Keith, you voted 
on these changes. The PGA Tour voted on these changes. Like I will argue that professional golfers are really, really bad at this. That they want to ignore anything in their life that doesn't feature a, a driver, or a pitching wedge, or, or, or a putter. Is that's where they need to focus, and I understand that. However, once something like this comes on the pike after they tried to talk to you, I'm sure that someone tried to talk to John and Tiger about these changes, and they come, they were like, nope, don't have time for that. Well, now it doesn't suit your purposes, so you're going to push back. Well, tough. Like, we'll get around to fixing it, and I do agree that it does need to be adjusted a little bit, but you had your chance to talk, and you didn't want to take it. Yeah, I mean, I'm not a mathematician either, um, so I'm not going to get any into any potential fixes. I do – want to float a theory though rex something i've been thinking about at least more than uh, a couple of minutes why do we even need the official world golf ranking why can't the governing bodies or the major championship entities just take instead of the top 50 or top 60 from the world ranking take top 50 or 60 from last season's fedex cup take the top 10 on the dp world tours uh race to dubai take the top 10 on live, throw them in there. And then you can still have your usual qualifiers. Like, can you remind me again, why we actually need the official world golf ranking? It sounds like a, like a two IPA conversation that you and I would be having in a pub somewhere. Yes. And I'm, yes, I'm trying to ignore you while I, I drink another headache. Um, I, I will say that. They why, do, started, why do we need it? Why, why do we uh, need it? I, I will say that the, way, the reason it started, to answer that very, very quickly, was specifically for the major championship. They were trying to find a way to quantify who the best players in the world are to make sure that what you had at the major championships were the best fields available. And at the time, there was nothing along those lines. You just kind of based it entirely on who qualified and who wasn't qualified. In this particular case, I think you still need some way to sort of bridge that gap. I would argue that the new system does a better job bridging that gap and saying that okay all the players who compete specifically on the pga tour can be compared to the players who compete specifically on the dp world tour because there is crossover and you're counting that crossover in every single player it's 156 players in the field you're taking 156 examples and cross and looking at who they competed against and who they beat i think the new system is better for that is it perfect no i hate math i'm not good at it i can't balance my own checkbook I'm not going to sit here and pretend, but I do think it does serve a purpose still to this day. But Rory also said it's going to take 12 to 18 months for the system to sort itself out and, and regulate. If that's the case, I want to see the majors go rogue in 2023. I want to see them go rogue, blow up their, their criteria. It, I mean, it wouldn't be a drastic change. Would it not? Like, I think there's probably going to be a lot of crossover. If you just, if you took, if you eliminated the world ranking, and did FedEx Cup list, DP World list, Live list. Like that is a great if – you, if you're the U.S. Open, if you're Mike Wan, head of the USJ, and you're taking the top 60 uh, in the world ranking as – it's usually like as of May 22nd or whatever. Like why don't you do top 50 from 2022? Why don't you do top 10 on the PGA Tour who would not other, otherwise be qualified? So in other words, guys who are absolutely tearing it up in 2023 or having breakout seasons who wouldn't have uh, otherwise qualified. Then you can take the 10 from Europe. You can take 10 from live that keeps them happy. You ensure that the Dustin's and the cam Smith's and the Neiman's and the Abe answers of the world uh, are still going to be taken care of that way. And then you still have the qualifying aspect, which is what you and I love uh, so much about the U S open. I think I just figured out the major conundrum for 2023. Just sitting here on this Golf Central podcast presented by Cowboy Golf. As the agent of chaos, as the chief agent of chaos, I would have expected nothing less than you than, than coming in with a, just a wrecking ball into the middle of something that's already getting wrecked from every every possible angle. That that I mean, it, it, it's already just chaos. Doesn't that solve? Doesn't that solve the issue? If everyone's no. claiming that this the world rankings broken and that it's irrelevant. And that Liv doesn't have world ranking points. Like, well, this is this is the ultimate working. Or, this is the ultimate workaround. Well, now you're you're taking two very very separate, very very distinct arguments and, and pulling them together because they seem to point in the direction you want, which is chaos. When you talk about Cam Smith saying that it's no, not, I'm relevant, not saying I want. I'm not saying Cam I want Smith chaos. I want the majors specific. to have the best players. I want the majors to have the best players. Cam Smith is saying that because he has a horse in the race. It is important for him and I everyone else that. on Liv Golf. So his, his motivation is completely different. Than John Rahm's motivation. John Rahm's John Rahm's calling it laughable. How is laughable, laughable any, any different than irrelevant? 
but they're talking about two very, very vastly separate things. As far as when it comes to Liv Goff, I, I, I don't know why we keep having this conversation. There is zero motivation for the official world golf ranking to quickly on allowing Liv Goff into the rankings, simply because they don't have to. There is a formula that set. Tiger Woods just talked about this, saying that when this event got world ranking points, it's been a little over a decade ago. That there was a criteria that said you need to, to run that event for three years so we can evaluate it. He said at that point, we'd already ran it for more than a decade. They, they saw the body of work and they just they gave us world ranking points. The same argument now applies to Live Golf, that they need to see this work out. And whatever that schedule was this year is not the same as it's going to be next year. So there is zero motivation for them to, to suddenly say, you know what, we're right. We're going to go ahead and give world ranking points to Live Golf. That's not the way it's going to work. And you can't conflate the two. These are two vastly different conversations that you're trying to put together. I'm telling you, if history is any indication, if Dustin Johnson falls out to the top 50 or top 100, the amount of hand wringing that's going to happen for both players on the PJ Tour, who clearly know Dustin Johnson, generational talent, been one of the best players uh, on the PJ Tour for more than a decade, and on Liv, who's getting their heads beat in by this guy uh, week in, and week out, if somehow Dustin Johnson, who for some somehow has become the barometer of 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 all that's right in the official world golf ranking, if somehow he tumbles out of the top fifty, top seventy five, or top one hundred, which is probably going to happen uh, with uh, the more time passes, you'll see the majors will come to my side, and we can point to this Golf Central podcast presented by Callaway Golf on November 29th as the turning point. This is uh, the hope- beauty of your hot takes is that you can just keep throwing them against the wall. You're only going to revisit the ones that are, that come true. Like you're never going to go back and revisit that. Who did you have to the player of the year? Justin Thomas. Uh, no, it was, it was Kyle. It was Kyle Morikawa uh, who went, who went winless throughout 2022. I will say hearing Tiger say that, did, hold on. He, did hold, just win. Hold, he just got married. Good for him. He did. Uh, congratulations yeah. uh, to Mr. And Mrs. Morikawa. I will say Rex Tiger Woods saying that, his goal this year was just to play the Open Championship at St. Andrews. That was actually validating for me because that was my bold prediction that the only time we're going to see Tiger this year was at the old course. I was like, yes, didn't technically get it right, but at least me and Tiger uh, were very right much on uh, the wave. Like, no, we did not. Uh, nine competitive rounds uh, for Tiger Woods, including, including two big cuts in the majors. Uh, I, hap- I happen to notice that the bunk mate did not join you in the Bahamas. I'm sure she was looking uh, to soak up a little fun in the sun. What's on your docket now that you don't actually have to uh, follow Tiger Woods uh, for the next five days? She did not want to come down. You're not going to believe this because uh, I did not get a room at the Baja Mar, which is a very, very nice resort here on the island. Anyone who's come down here will tell you how, how nice it is. But every time she's ever come down here in the past, she wants to stay at the courtyard, which is right sort of just on the fringes of Nassau, which is Shout where you were Junkaroo. Court- Junkaroo. Junkaroo. Courtyard Junkaroo. Junkaroo Beach. It's the name of a beach. There's plenty of restaurants on the beach. Like it's just a really fun little buzzy area. It's, it's fun to be down there. And it's only like 10 minutes further from the golf course than the Baja Mar. But because I couldn't get a room at the Baja Mar, she said no. So that's where we are in our life. Her, her uh, silver slippers are too tight and her golden watch uh, just doesn't tell time correctly. That, that's, that's the first world problem we're dealing with. Perhaps it's because you spoiled her with a month-long European vacation uh, earlier right. this year that she's now <laughs> expecting only the best. I will say I'm very disappointed to be missing this, even with, with or without Tiger. Like, obviously, it would have been great uh, to, to chart Tiger for a couple of days, but it's a star-studded field. Uh, never been to this tournament. I was hoping to cross it off the list, perhaps in 2023. I guess we'll have to see about the budgets uh, for that. Here on the home base, Rex, uh, since you'll be spending the week in the Bahamas, obviously Georgia playing in the SEC championship game against LSU uh, Saturday the- at 4 p.m. I mean, that's going to be an absolute slaughtering. Uh, you love to see it. I'll be decked out in my DeAndre Just Swift drinking the tea, are you? jersey. Oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Although, although Georgia USC, Georgia USC in the first playoff game, uh, I'm going to have to try and score tickets to that. I did want to give a shout out, Rex. Uh, I think it was last week's podcast, maybe it was two weeks ago, uh, where I unveiled uh, the big Labner plans to have an outdoor kitchen, which certainly could come in handy for some of our video segments uh, beginning in 2023. I am just about to plunk down a deposit for a new smoker. Uh, yes, folks, I'm finally getting in to the offset smoker game. It has been uh, a long wait, five, six years since I've been begging my wife uh, that I can get one now that we're uh, doing the outdoor kitchen. She has finally loosened the reins. Uh, and allowed me to get one. So shout out Shirley Fabrication. 
uh, uh, they make uh, wonderful cookers and smokers out of Tuscaloosa, Alabama. I'm going to be getting a 24 by 36 patio model. The thing is absolutely built like a tank. I saw a dude in Ponte Vedra, shout out Logan, uh, let me to come over to his house on Monday night to look at his patio model, wanted to sell it to me. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I'm just going to go ahead and get it new. Right, it is 850 pounds. It's on pneumatic wheels. Like you technically can move around your patio area, but it is absolutely enormous, uh, indestructible, uh, three eighths inch steel, uh, in the chamber, quarter inch steel in the firebox. The thing is meant to last a lifetime and a better, uh, for the amount that we're going to be paying for it. Uh, but shout out Shirley fabrication. Uh, I'll be sending you uh, many snap, many snappy chats, uh, when the new smoker arrives, I think in like six months, it's a very long way. These are, these are hand. Oh yeah, these are handcrafted, baby. These aren't just these aren't just your Traegers that you can that you can that you can just roll out of your neighborhood Ace. Shout out Ace if you want to sponsor us. Uh, feel free to do uh, so. Sure. Uh, just you, you can't you can't just you can't how just find these in a factory, yeah. right? Well, what's the count now? How many grills? If we're including my little Weber Smoky Joe, which is my tailgating grill, and that's another uh, topic for uh, another podcast, uh, since you and I are trying to do a tailgating series. Uh, I think this brings us to an even 10. You got a problem, man. You have a real problem. I say I that. This, I think this I'm brings going us to 10. Three. I'm going to uh, have my third uh, on Christmas. Uh, as you're driving home from New Orleans on Friday, Black Friday, everyone in the car was, was thumbing through her, uh, Amazon because apparently Cyber Friday is a bigger thing now. And she uh, turned to me randomly, the bunkmate, and said, uh, would you want a Blackstone? Like, well, yes, I would. Yes. And so, uh, yes. Now, it's a smaller one. I don't think it's the same size as yours, but I'm very excited about that. That was my Christmas present a year ago, and now I'm having it built in to the outdoor kitchen. I think, Rex, it is a must-have in any man cave slash outdoor area. Like, it's it's just an absolute must. We're trying to do a hibachi uh, either on Thursday or Friday. It's great for breakfast, family breakfast. Everyone can get involved. Smash burgers. You'll never have another burger another way than having uh, a burger off a flat top grill. That's very exciting. Do you get to, do you get to try it out early? Or do you have to wait until uh, uh, Santa's, Santa's elves have, have cleared the area, have cleared, yeah, have cleared Longwood? That'll be a December 26th. Yeah, I'll, I'll be sure to call you and then have you walk me through the hibachi because that sounds interesting. I will also say that, and I think I, I bragged about this this, this week, so I need to circle back around and take my long time on this one, that I thought it was, yeah, it was a really good idea. I didn't want to stay in someone else's house in Louisiana, in New Orleans, because I just don't like it. It's uncomfortable. I don't like s- sleeping in someone else's bed. Like it just, I, I just don't like it. I thought a good idea was to get a room in the French Quarter for my wife and my three boys. It was a terrible idea. Do you have any idea how difficult it is to wrangle all four of those idiots in in the French Quarter? Wait, you're talking about bunk mate and your three sons? Yes, yes. We got it. We got a. We got a room. It was like a two bedroom room. You know, a hotel room in the French Quarter on whatever it was. It was Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday night. And then we went over across the lake, did Thanksgiving, and spent the night with her relatives, the dermatologist, on uh, Thursday, and then drove home Friday. It's a terrible idea. What was the French Quarter like on Thanksgiving? Uh, wasn't there on Thanksgiving Thursday? Obviously, we're at the dinner, uh, and the rest of the week it was buzzing. It was just it was blowing up, like just hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people. And I, I think I told you this when I was there earlier this year for the Zero Classic, like. You cannot walk down Bourbon Street anymore. Like it is a zoo. It is yeah. where wild animals go and it misfit toys. Like you do not want to go anywhere near Bourbon Street. Yeah, my father and I went there uh, in June for his uh, delayed 65th uh, birthday present. Yes, <laughs> we. I think we. I think we saw every street uh, in the French Quarter exactly. except for Bourbon Street. Uh, I mean, I showed him. I showed him what it looked like, and then we scurried as quick as we could uh, over to safety. Again, love New Orleans fantastic place to spend two nights and three days uh, your little your little eight day sojourn there uh was about was about five days too many luckily you made it out alive uh you don't how many sazeracs are too many sazeracs i know no, the, the answer, answer the answer three. is always three yeah two's always. not enough three's too many yeah correct that, that, that's the, that's the world i lived in for eight straight days yep stop at two and then order uh, something more delicious, like a double IPA, uh, which sure. I'm sure you nice. enjoyed as well. Well, go get fat and happy and sunburned on the beach. Make sure to put sunscreen specifically 
uh, on your little cancer spot above yeah. your right eye. But thank you guys for listening. Better. Exactly. Or is, uh, neither is plantar fasciitis, uh, yeah. as you heard at the beginning of this podcast. But thank you guys for listening to this edition, the Golf Central podcast presented by Callaway Golf. Make sure to check out golfchannel.com for all of Rex's reports from the Hero World Challenge. They unfortunately will not include any Tiger Woods golf recaps. And then next week, I'll be in Stamford, Connecticut, co-hosting Golf Today with my boy Damon Hacks. We'll have to have a report on how that's going before Rex then takes over. Thank you guys for listening. Have a great rest of the week. Feel better, Russ.